And we welcome you by uh, internet, we welcome you by television, and we welcome you, most importantly, in this place. But you know what? Before we get started, you could open up your Bible to uh, Genesis in chapter 1. And uh, I just want to take a moment. I see you back there. I want to take a moment, and I want to invite you, if you're watching us by television, uh, I want to invite you. I can say about our congregation what a lot of you pastors can't say. And I told them earlier during the time of receiving tithe and offering, which we take about 10 minutes in every one of our services to do so, to explain our covenant of tithe and, and to encourage to give it to the kingdom of God. And it fits in with what we're teaching on, God's provision and his covenant of prosperity. But I want to let you know, if you're out there, okay, uh, there's not many churches that could, uh, the pastor could say, even when my people go away on vacation or they miss a service for some reason, or other, uh, that they, they come in and they have an offering envelope for the offerings that were taken on that service that they missed. Most churches will say, praise God, I missed the service. I could go down and buy another lunch or something, you know. But our people are not that way. It's a true story. It really is a true story. I can brag on my church, which I do to other pastors. I says, you know, how many churches can say that uh, pastors can say that their church even gives when they're not there? Because they're committed. You're loyal. And I have a loyal, committed church, but you know what? A lot of them are getting in their senior years. I'm looking for some younger people. What do you mean? What age? Younger people. Well, younger people is how you think. I had a hand clap. Amen. How you think. Younger people that are wanting to develop something, find their destiny for their life through the Word of God. We, let me tell you what this church helps you do. Helps you, helps you get out of debt. Helps you to, to evaluate your stewardship. Helps you to buy a home. Helps you to maintain a home. Helps you to get out of an old rust bucket into a nice vehicle. Amen. How? Through this word. Okay. Learning values and, and learning what God wants. He has a destiny for each and every one of us. I want to encourage you. Don't be uh, taken back and, uh, or, or say, whoa, I heard about that church. Come in and find out for yourself. We want to be a blessing to you. Amen. We do have some, some young people. So young is really how you think. Yeah. Amen? There's nothing wrong with being a senior, but you know what? Seniors don't want to start businesses. Okay? I'm looking for some people who want to start business, make some money. Yeah. Amen. All right. Praise God. You excited? Yes. I hope you're excited. I'm excited. Amen. So young is really uh, uh, not your age. I mean, I got so much things rolling around that God has taught me, and now... I pastor and I preach and I teach and run the TV station and I don't get to use all these gifts and talents. I look at houses, I want to go buy them, you know. <laughs> I see money to be made. Oh, well, praise God anyway. Somebody out there. Okay, listen to this as we continue on. We're continuing on today his covenant of prosperity and uh, God, it's part of God's provision that we've been looking at. We looked into partnership in the past, God's uh, provision. And I want to share something when I was studying this week, what I've seen. But uh, I want to read out of the Amplified Bible. And uh, if you're at Genesis, go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply. I know some people that are doing that. They're having child after child. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Listen now, here's the part. This is the Amplified Bible. Using all its vast resources in the service of God and man and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves upon the earth. I mean, this even works in the, in the woods for hunting. Amen? It works on the lake for fishing or in the ocean. Okay. Uh, but I want you to see something there. He's saying... Uh, using all its vast resources in the service of God and man. The religious church don't teach this stuff. Man, I don't want to become religious. How about you? Just a, a dried out religion, come to church, and you know we can become religious even being word of faith. Quoting the word of God, casting out demons, you know, believing and using the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But that's the end of our life. We're not making any kind of impact in the kingdom of God. And this week, I'm looking over the past week, and it's amazing, even though this isn't being aired just yet probably, but it's amazing that uh, Dr. Charles Stanley's teaching on, on provision, God's provision, finances, the reason for wealth, okay? 
So I think I coined this, I don't know, but I said materialism is wealth without a purpose. I don't know where I got that from, but I know it always comes to my mind, wealth without a purpose. Materialism is wealth without a purpose. That's what materialism. So if you want wealth, but you have no reason for it other than just to lavish things upon you, you know, uh, you'll, you really will never go down the right road. Because uh, <clears throat> listen to what I found out. What is materialism? And I have a note, wealth without a purpose. That's, that's my view of it. But listen to the American Dictionary, okay? American Dictionary. Now, I don't know if you know this, but there's two different ways of spelling materialism. One's with an A and one's with an E. And I found that's real interesting. The American Di Dictionary, materialism with an A, listen to what this is. The theory or doctrine that physical well-being and worldly uh, possessions constitute the greatest good and highest value in life. Man, if that don't describe the church today that's walking in the carnal, carnal mind, thinking that because you have something, you're spiritual and you're blessed, okay? But really, that's why the world is so busy working, okay? Because they think that when you get it, how do you know this? I used to be like this. I thought when I got that other house, when I got that bigger motor home, when I got that second house, when I bought that land, uh, when I bought my uh, street rod, my hot rod, whatever it was, I always thought that, or when I move here, or I go there, I always thought that's what it was till I finally made it, had it, and I found out there wasn't nothing in it because Jesus wasn't Lord of my life. I wasn't saying I wasn't saved. I got saved. He was my savior, but he wasn't my Lord. And that's the word materialism. Listen again. Materialism with an A. The theory or doctrine that physical well-being and worldly possessions constitute the greatest good and highest value in life. No, it don't. Relationship with Jesus Christ is the highest value in life. But we think this till we get it. And then if we get it and don't go, you know the studies even on 60 Minutes in past years, people who win the lotto and the lottery, how their life is destroyed in a certain amount of time. I'm sure if someone won that, that was stable in financial thing, but the problem is most of them are not gamblers. That's the, that's the issue right there. I'm not talking about whether they're Christians or not. Most of them are not the gamblers. But listen to this word here, spelt with an E, materialism. You can look this up in the dictionary online or in your bookcase. Okay, materialism with an E means this. Supplies of the military force or other organizations. Isn't that interesting? Look it up in the dictionary, you'll see it. Supplies for the military forces or other organizations, like God's organization. Okay, see there's a way of, of receiving what God wants us without going shipwreck. Uh, money is not evil, the love of money is the evil. The love of money is the evil, okay? That's why most people that are unstable in their, in their relationship with the Lord, when they do tap into the wealth of God, you'll see that they don't come to church as much. They don't need anything other than Sunday after a while. Well, what happened? Well, the things that they're buying have overcome them. They're, oh, well, thank you, Jesus, as they wax their new whatever they got, you know, or they're too busy working on their home. Or they stayed up too late last night, and God wants me to be a good steward, so i got to finish my lawn today. Whatever the reason is, that doesn't do away with the truth, okay? You're always going to have unstable people. But Jesus said, he gave us an example. There's a 30, 60, and 100-fold, you know, return. And, and there's only a few 30%. Because what happens? People decide that they don't want to pay the price. See, they want what you have, but they're not willing to pay the price for it. They just want it given to them. And there is a price paid by the word of God. And you decide where your part is. You decide how far you go. You know, you decide it. Young people have not exhausted themselves. What do you mean young people? I'm not only talking about whether you're 20, 30, 40, or 50. I'm talking about how young you are in the Lord yeah. and excited you are for the Lord because some people after 20 years with the Lord, are like they, they just don't matter if they speak in tongues, cast out devils, they're just like a Pharisee. 
I'm going to pay my tithe. I'm going to give to the TV. I'm going to give missions. And they have no, no kind of excitement to excel in their life. It's like they hit a plateau. And that's it. Well, God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to continuously go on. Continuously to go on. You excited? it. I, I really says, wow, what a, what a difference in that word there. So in Genesis, we've seen that God wants us to subdue and to, uh, to use the resources for the kingdom of God. Okay. Now, you know, what happens is when you start, when you start not having any cares of this world, okay, and everything is going on around you. I'm hearing faith people who, who talk to me, people that a word of faith, who studied faith for years, talking about the value of the dollar because they're going to make, make more money if they do this payout and if they do this here and the automobile industry. And, and these are all facts. But I can tell you one thing for sure. They're not affecting me. Okay. Because, see, the problem is you got the wrong kind of material. See, I got the material that's for the army of God. Okay. That's the wealth I'm looking for, and that's the wealth I want to stay on, not the material that I think everything is okay, okay? See, so if you're hooked in, yeah, but we're here on planet Earth. I know we're here, but we're not of here unless we want to be, okay? And I'm telling you something. This is why Christians fail in the world system is they're not using kingdom principles. They're using world principles, manipulation, and every other marketing idea, okay? So we're looking at the Word of God that God says every one of us here and every one of us who listens to the messages uh, from this pulpit or any other pulpit that is talking about God's provision, we are already qualified. The book of Colossians says that the Father already qualified us. But it's a matter of what we want to do with that. Okay, what we want to do with it. All righty, I can see you all excited. So go over to... Uh, Second Corinthians, and I mean that seriously. And as I as you go there, uh, I want to read uh, Ecclesiastes uh, in verse two twenty six. It says, "And God gives those who please Him wisdom, knowledge, and joy." So right there, I want you to know something to separate your thinking about God loves the world. So God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's right. But I also want you to hear what the Word of God says from Solomon, okay, the wisest man that was ever on the earth, that God, uh, God gives wisdom and knowledge for those who please him. Sometimes we get the mentality, everybody getting the same thing. You know? Yes, yeah, you've been brought up that way. I want to give all my kids the same thing because when we were kids, Joey got more than me, and Johnny got more than him. So I don't want that. We want them all the same. It's a bad mistake. It's called socialism. Yeah, it's a bad mistake. You get according to your work. You get according to your, to your hunger. Okay? So I want you to see something that God says here. He says, for God gives to those who please him wisdom, knowledge. I'd rather have wisdom and knowledge over all the riches of the world. Because wisdom and knowledge will let you produce everything you put your hand to will continue on. I mean, you know, uh, you could have all, all sorts of money, but no wisdom. There's only a matter of time before you have no more resources. Okay. So it's really not about, it's about how to handle, how to handle the resources that God has. What's, what you could access. You know, godly principles work with people who don't even know God personally. Jesus says their Lord and Savior. There is no other way. There is no other way. You know, there's people that say that, you know, well, they just go to God another way. Uh, I just wonder if you're really a Christian because that's not Christianity. Christianity says Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. Okay, he didn't say next to anybody else. He's the only way of salvation. That's how Christianity. So I just wonder if you're really a Christian. You know, you can call yourself a Christian, but the doctrine of a Christian is there is no other way of salvation but in the name of Jesus. Okay, so, but I've seen godly principles work in corporations and, and their corporation be blessed, okay, because they do principles like a lot of corporations. They give money away. 
okay? They get repaid for that money. I'm not talking about their tax write-off. The principles of God are set in action, okay? You excited? Yeah. Somebody's excited. Adrian's excited. Adrian's going to be a millionaire. Yeah. He has ambition. He's not tired. He's not weary. He's not fainting. Hallelujah. Uh, we had 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter three. If you dare say amen. amen. All right, look at verse sixteen. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Okay. I want to read this in an amplified Bible. Three sixteen of uh, Second Corinthians Amplified. Whenever a person turns in repentance to the Lord, the veil is stripped off and taken away. Now, where the Lord is is the Spirit, and there is where the Spirit is of the Lord is there is liberty, emancipation from bondage and freedom. And the word emancipation means this: listen, free from bondage, oppression, or restraint. And the, the number two uh, meaning of that word is: listen to this. To release a child from the control of parents or guardian. I find that real interesting. This is God's principles. God, God's principles is, is, you know, and you know the story about uh, the young boy being under a schoolmaster, okay, the, for guidance and stuff. And there's a time that comes where God says that he releases us, okay, he releases us to all that he owns, he releases us to. And there's not a lot of people, but there are so many people that come, come to this point to be released to all that God owns. So when, when a man turns his heart to the Lord, how do you turn your heart to the Lord? In repentance, not just getting born again, okay? But you turn your heart to the Lord where you, you kind of open up your heart and stay teachable that, you know what? Maybe, maybe his way is better than mine. I mean, don't you find this amazing that we try all our ways, even when they fail, we still want to try them over and over and over again? True. You know, that just shows you the power of the, the, the course of the human being, the fall, fallen nature of man. Every one of us have it, every single one. We were talking about earlier, before the service started, about, you know, uh, building a house and the timing of building a house. And it's not like the urge wasn't there to do it, but it wasn't the right time. But uh, you know what? I learned by doing other things in my past that were in God's time, because we're those charismatic people. We get something to God, drop something in our heart. We don't even figure out whether how to do it. We just figure God said it, so it's going to work. And most 99% people fall on their face, you know, because they think because God said it, it's going to work. You know, no, God says it, then you begin to get the knowledge, which means you got to open up some kind of books. Say books. books. All right, and this is the best one. Okay, and you have to look into what you're doing. You have to look into what you're doing, and God will give it to you, and it will always come to pass if he gave it to us to do. But we have to have insight. Sometimes when people get, you know, oh, God's telling me we're going to do this or I'm going to do that. Well, that's fine. I don't say he's not telling you, but how are you going to bring it about? Are you going to cooperate with him? You know, are you going to cooperate with him? You know, before God could start this television station in Mannington, he had to get me to Mannington. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So we're looking at God's provision, and uh, he wants to provide. I'll tell you, I was just telling someone over the phone, with the economy the way it is and everything that's going on in our country, I think I'm more blessed now than I've ever been in my life, than I've ever been in my life. But I also have common sense. I don't buy things out of order in my life. Okay, you know, uh, I was listening to Dr. Stanley the other day, and he's, you know, he says, you know, well, even he says even me. So now I don't know how much you know about him, but his hobby, his he likes photography. He likes to go into the wild and take pictures and stuff. He says I got to watch out that I don't need every new camera that comes out. Okay, so you know, there's a, there's a wise man. You know, there's a wise man. Now I'm sure he could afford to buy every new camera that comes out. But see, he still has prioritizing in his life. Yes. It's not about buying it. 
Well, first of all, if you buy it, you buy it. You don't buy it and make payments on it. Okay? That's okay with a good ticket, you know, a big ticket item. Okay. But, you know, so you can buy it or you can buy it if it's necessary. I mean, people that with computers that are into computers, they want to change computers every six months. And they don't realize that's the world how the market is set up. So you, yours will be a, they call it a dinosaur after six months. Hey, man, give me all those dinosaurs at half price. Because most people can't even ride the dinosaur. <laughs> they can't. They can't use all that's in that box. Right. You know, so there are a few, you know, they get excited. But that's because they read that you become a geek. You know, you start reading that stuff there. You get so excited. <laughs> Computer geek. Amen. What's the difference now? There's smart people that are making money on that other stuff. You can get twice the amount of money for you. This is the wisdom that God says he'll give us. Yes. Okay, we'll get, have wisdom. We'll have knowledge. We don't have to keep up with uh, whoever. I can't. <laughs> I don't want to say name of a, a name of a family. I don't know where they got that coin from, you know. But <laughs> anyway, praise God. Okay, so uh, let me read some of these notes. This is out of our, uh, uh, his covenant of prosperity. Listen to this. When I was in Uganda last week, this is in 1999, the Lord spoke to me as I was ministering the Word of God. He, he said to me, I'm going to release through you an anointing for my ministers to prosper. These are the ministers we have overseas. I, I said, Lord, you'll have to confirm this to me. because Why did I ask this for confirmation? Because the Lord had never used me to release many different kinds of anointings. He did, but not over the over the area of prosperity and finances. So it wasn't more than five minutes. Listen to this. After God was speaking this to me, I'm ministering to the pastors in uh, Uganda. I forget where we were in the pastors' conference. And uh, it wasn't more than five minutes when my wife walked up to me and handed me a note. And she said, the Lord said, this is May 17, 1999 at 5.30 p.m., Tell my ministers, if they will stay through today and tomorrow, there will be an anointing deposited upon them for prospering, such as they have never seen before. He says he didn't say never had before, but that they have never seen before. Okay? And it happened. It happened. Some of our pastors over there, uh, of course, they, people still have challenges in life, but, I mean, they had nothing at all. And uh, the best example, I would say, even though there are many, would be uh, our son Michael in, in Kenya. He owns a home. It started out with a cell phone. You know, when I first was going to Africa, a cell phone was $1,000. It wasn't like today, you just take a service or you get one for $29. It was $1,000 for a cell phone. So they, they have cell phones now. Everybody has a cell phone over there. They have cell phones. They own, uh, they own a home to live in. That's a great, great accomplishment in Africa, uh, they have an automobile. That means they had to go get a license. When God spoke to Michael about getting an automobile, he went and got a license. He got the license years before he got the automobile. You know, what's the sense of believing for an automobile when you don't, have, don't know how to drive? Unless you're believing for a chauffeur too. Amen? Okay, so we've seen this happen. And it, it's, it, you know, and it could happen here and continue moving on. Uh, listen to this. When I was driving home, because this is confirmation. God tells you something, and this is confirmation. Uh, when we were driving home from the airport on Sunday, Reverend Dave, my associate, handed me a file. He said, I brought you a file with some reports. I know you don't want to waste any time. <laughs> yeah. Am I still like that? <laughs> so he brought me a file so I could read it on the way home from the airport to update me. As I began to read these reports, there was a note that said, Pastor, I was, in, I was praying Saturday, May 15th at 10.55 a.m., and the Lord said to me, he is doing something different in this conference. He is using it to spark a whole new movement. You know, uh, I'm telling you, when God does something in our life, he begins to confirm it to us. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That's just not a cliche. We don't just, oh, God said this and you're going to walk out the door and accomplish it. What's going to happen is, if you don't let God prepare you, mm -hmm. then you're just going to fall, well, may not fall uh, on your face, but you're just going to get discouraged and never even do it. Yeah. 
and then eventually you say, well, it probably wasn't for God. Here's a good religious coin. It must not be God's timing. So when a Christian fails, they say it wasn't God's timing. It must not be God's timing. How about this one here? Come on, we've all used these here. How about this one here? I'm waiting on the Lord. I found out he's waiting on us. Okay, he's waiting on us to be developed. You know, I was talking to an apostle on the phone last night, and I said, you know, God is really stirring something in me, and I don't feel satisfied, and uh, God, I believe that the TV stations are going to explode in the near future, but I want to be ready. I want to be ready to handle it. I'm not focusing on God and what he's going to do. I'm focusing on Nick and what I need to do. I need more time with the Lord. I need more time in the Word. I don't feel like I'm getting fed. Why is that? Because I'm going to a new place. I'm in transition. But I want to be prepared. I'm not looking at God. He don't fail. Man fails. Okay, man fails. The failure of ministries with money has always been because of the lack of character in men. It's never been because of God. Okay? Those who have fell that went before us, it was because of their lack of character that they allowed not God in certain areas of their life, and that's what happened. Okay? When I hear something, you know, I hear about someone dying premature, or I hear someone, I heard about someone, a great minister, a national minister, left his wife, and he, he's got a new church with a new wife. Just like that. Boom. Just like that. You know, when I heard that, we were sitting on it. I says, oh, God, keep me. Oh, Lord. Because I know the Bible says when you say, oh, I'd never do that, you better watch out. You know? You know? You know, God, keep me. Help me. Never that, that, that never happened to me. Okay? You know, that's how we have to look at things. So we have to watch our little cliches we have. We're waiting on God. You know? Uh of course, there's times where that's a legitimate statement, but we don't want to make it just a sentence out of our mouth. We're waiting on God. Or we don't want to fail at something and say, well, you know what? Well, it must not be God's time. But here's the big one. Well, you know, if this was God's time, everything would fall together perfectly. <laughs> Who taught you that? There's very few times in all my life with the Lord that that's ever worked out where everything just went so smooth. It's kind of like putting whipped cream on top, of the, on top of the ice cream. Then we're saying, and if anything is restricted to go past the powers of darkness on planet Earth to do something for the Lord, it's not God's time because it's too hard. No, you're too lazy. I don't say it. The Word says it in Proverbs. Okay. Are you listening to me? All right. Uh, let's go over to uh, 1 Timothy in chapter 6. 1 Timothy in chapter 6. I was so so amazed over those two different words. Uh, can I get a, someone just to raise their hand if you can answer me this? You don't need to speak out, but all I want to know is, has anybody ever heard that or knew that about the two different words with an A or an E for materialism? Isn't that something? That's an American dictionary. It's the regular dictionary of the English language. You know, there's so much in there. You know, a lot of those dictionaries are written by Christians. Amen. Yeah, Webster was a, a Christian, and many of the other ones were Christians. They even use a scripture for a reference uh, in some of those uh, words in the dictionary. But I thought that was so powerful uh, because we have that in the body of Christ today, and that's why people reject having wealth in the body of Christ because they think, well, the same thing when I started teaching it in Africa in, uh, in the early uh, mid-90s mid to the early uh, late 90s, how missionaries got mad at me, got upset with me. Not that you, What are you teaching them that? I says, you know what? God don't want them to be, to be dependent on you, the Mzungu, the white man, the missionary. He wants them to come on their own, you know? And a lot of them can today. First Timothy 6, are you there? <clears throat> and uh, look at verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, 
nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Uh, that's the NIV I'm reading. But I want you to notice something here. Command those, teach those, teach those, preach to those that are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth. If any of you have seen Dr. Sutton on, he quoted from one of our presidents how the beginning of our downfall will be when America thinks that we're so rich and blessed because of our own, our own abilities and taking the, cr the credit away from God. That's what's happened, isn't it? You know, uh, most young people say like Johnny's age, they probably don't even get much history in, in school. Don't even know about our presidents, you know. Uh, don't even know that we are a Christian nation. Not maybe. It's documented. I mean, it's documented. You know, well, who put all those scriptures and all, all the sayings uh, all over the buildings and all over our money? You know, but you know what? It keeps going the way it is. It keeps going the way it is. Before you know it, the people that are two and three and four years old, they won't know nothing about Christianity in America. Nothing at all. Whose fault will it be? Our fault. If I can teach 12, I'd be happy. Take 12 little kids and fill them up with God's principles and our country, where they're going to work, where they're going to live, and all that God has for this, that we are a Christian nation. Well, what about all the others? Forget about all the others. You can't reach all the others, but you, each one of us can reach somebody. But today, okay, the today is like, you know, holiday time. We don't want to, re let's not mention religion. Well, that's because you're religious and you want to fight. You're better off not mentioning religion. I mean, my Lord, it shouldn't matter whether someone's a Baptist, a Catholic, or a Pentecostal, you know, unless you're a creepy one and you want to fight. You want to prove yourself to be right, you know. So that's a lack of character. It's not a lack of Christianity. The person who messes up with money, money's not the problem. The person's the problem. The person who messes up with Christianity, Christianity's not the problem. The person is the problem. They want, to be, uh, they want to be the one that's right. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Okay. What do these things have to do with uh, uh, his covenant of prosperity? I don't know, but I feel like I'm inspired to say them. So they must have something to do with it. Amen? <laughs> you know, I can only teach uh, good when is when, you know, when, when, over the years, I found out when uh, sin would come into the church, people were in adultery and fornication in the church, okay? And they knew better, not, not new converts, but people who knew better and knew it was sin. Man, I would try to teach a message. Before you know it, I was pounding sin, okay? And God's always good to us. No matter what's going on in our life, he wants us to repent, amen? Amen. But it's good to have a church that you could teach on things that, we're at a place where maybe we're not doing everything right, but we're willing. See, God never had a problem in the Bible with anybody. I can't find anybody had a problem in the Bible with, with ignorance. The only trouble you'll see in the, in the Bible is when people rebel against God. And you can't rebel against God unless you know it. Amen? Okay. So this verse declares that God wants to provide all we need not just to get by, but for our enjoyment. Don't it say that? Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. So all the Christians that are all upset about their wealth, they got their hope in their wealth. Yeah. Oh, I'm not making this much money on this. I'm not making this on this. So what? If you're wise and you fall into Ecclesiastes, God will give you wisdom not to lose any of your money. And if everybody else is losing around you and you're holding your ground, you know what? You're prospering. Amen. You know, you're prospering. Are you, are you listening to me? 
Amen. You know, you can't apply any of this stuff unless you do have a little bit of, of, of wisdom from God. You know, uh, I know when they, they interviewed me on the newspaper back, I said, oh, man, i got to watch myself because they can really change your words around, you know. Uh, and it was about the, the, the bailout, you know, and all the different political views we have of bailout. But if you look at the numbers, okay, the bailout, the automobile industry for $33 billion, okay, Without the automobile industry, the government's going to lose $170 billion in taxes. So you go one and one is two. I mean, it's not hard to figure out if you really get your facts and understand what you're doing. So, it, you know, oh, why should they bail them out when they drove? They came to the meeting in Washington with a jet. The CEOs of General Motors and these other countries, they flew here with a jet, and you're going to bail them out. A pea brain mentality. Okay, when the when the government sees that if they don't do this bailout for 33 million, they're going to lose 170 billion, not million, 170 billion in taxes in revenue. Because don't you know if they stop making cars, they stop selling steel. They stop selling steel, people lose their jobs. I mean, so it, it cataplunks all the way through. It's not hard to figure out. The wisdom of God could show you that just like that. Yeah. Are you listening to me? No, it's not the answer, but it is an answer. You know. And then I got people, word of faith, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. The value of dollars is going down more. Now if they do this, and I just listen on the other end, and I say, you know, I thank you, Father. I could care less because your book tells me I'm going to succeed. This is, this is for young businessmen. I'm going to succeed no matter what happens in this world. Amen. See, if you're a Christian, amen, give him a hand clap. If you're a Christian and you're going, to, you're going to depend on the stock market or the unemployment rate, okay, you've still got your hope in the riches of this world. I know you go to work. I know you get a paycheck. I understand all that. You have to change up here and you'll succeed. You have to change up here. The Jewish people have done it for, for hundreds of years. Man, those people don't know too much. I'm not saying all of them, but the business ones. They don't see failure. If something goes down, they pick something back up. Okay? And God's people need to see that. You getting this, Adrian? I'm preaching to you today. This is your future. Amen. So the Lord wants to provide everything for our enjoyment. Although God receives enjoyment through our prosperity, please understand that this is not the true reason God gives us wealth. You understand that? The Bible says that God, God takes pleasure in our prosperity. Now those theologians that are, are doc, indoctrinated with, with uh, uh, denominational thinking, okay, are really wrong because if you look up the words, the word prosperity means to succeed in business, you know? And no matter what their theology is that if people get money in the body of Christ that they can lose their Christianity, go back into the world, doesn't justify cutting off the wealth of God from God's people. Because if you don't get it up here, you're not getting it down here. You can work for it, but my Bible tells me that God gives Nick Lowley, he gives me the ability to get wealth. I don't have to go to work for wealth. You only can make so much money. You know, you can only make so much money. Two hands could only make so much money. One mind could only make so much money. I heard Copeland preaching on, on, uh, on he, this was a good one. He says, you know, he says, I know a lot of you pastors are not going to like that, but you just need to get people to administrate for you. He says, because he says, you're supposed to be in prayer and word. I said, well, praise God, I can tell you that. Amen. You know what? He says, and the administrators, they have to use their faith. I said, whoa, I like that one. Use their faith. Now, here's a guy where God told him they were making $353,000 for the income for their ministry in 1976. <clears throat> God says, I want you to go this year coming on every Christian radio station in the nation. Well, that was $400,000 a month. And they went on every radio station in the nation. He didn't ask God. He says, you know, how many chickens can you sell? 
Amen. He had to change it. What he was saying is he had to change his thinking. The chickens weren't going to work. The, the garage sales weren't going to work no more. I mean, you're talking 400000 a month. Okay, you know, you, you forget about the chickens and everything else. See, that's what we have, the, the body of Christ. We have mentality. Let's sell our junk. Let's, let's buy chickens, cook them, and sell them. You know, let's get candy bars and sell them, buy them for a dollar and sell them for three dollars. You know, <laughs> you can't reach those figures on that. You have to change your thinking. You've got to get kingdom thinking. Yes. And if I heard him correctly, which I believe I did, today the ministry operation is a million dollars a day. A million dollars a day. When I think back of when we did Bible school in Africa, it was enough for me to believe for those cameras that I had, those little whatever, they're pretty well used now, uh, three, four hundred, five hundred dollars to believe for that camera. Now, don't misunderstand me. I could have went out and charged it. I could have went out and bought it. God wanted me to believe for it. See, a lot of times we want to go out and buy something and say, God gave it to me. Okay. But I think back now that if I didn't walk through that series to get there, I wouldn't have been able to believe for the faith for what we're doing now. And I need to keep continuing to, to develop, to continue on for the kingdom of God. That's not just your pastor. That's every one of us in our lives. Every one of us. You start prioritizing what you buy and what you don't buy. I'm telling you, God's going to be showing up in your home in a greater degree. He's going to be showing up in your bank accounts in a greater degree. When you become a man and stop acting like a child, buying every little gadget that's out there. Okay? You've got to have every little gadget that's out there. Okay? Well, that means that your, your priorities out of whack. You know when you get every gadget that's out there? When you don't really care whether you have it anymore. Right. Not while well, it's like it's, a, it's an identity. Uh, uh, if you have this, then you're cool. You should see it. You know, got to have whatever kind of phone you got to have or, or stick one of those things in your ears. I know I got one in my ear. <laughs> you know, it took me, it probably took me 10 years, but you know, I could care less whether I got my cell phone with me anymore. <laughs> At one time, it was productive to have it, to keep things going and stuff. But sometimes, most of the time now, it's like, you know, uh, I'll say, well, I'll leave it in the car. We'll only be gone an hour. I mean, you know, what, what's going to happen in an hour that can't wait? Because it becomes a chain after a while. You know, if I'm eating lunch with someone and they got to answer their cell phone, I said, you know, maybe we should have lunch another time. You know, because you're very busy. I oh, love, what are you, a doctor on emergency call or something? <laughs> yeah, everywhere you go, look around, everybody's driving with their phone. If they don't have a phone, now they got the little thing, so you don't know if they're talking to themselves, they're on the phone, or they're praying. They got this little thing stuck in their ear, you know? Everybody's doing it. That's what our culture's becoming like. And you want to know something? That's what we begin to do with God. I pray while I get my coffee and I drive to work. I pray while I do this. I pray while I do that. I say, oh, God, I hope, I says, I hope one day you don't really need him close, you know, because he might be on a coffee break for you. Oh, no, God will meet me anyway. Yeah, right. Okay, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. You want, to, you want God's attention? Give him your attention. You don't only bring them in when you need them to show somebody about Jesus. Whoa, ouch! Ooh. <laughs> uh, turn over to uh, Psalms 35. So God wants us to have wealth, but he don't want us to put our hope in wealth. He wants us to put our hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I am so amazed that no matter what shows up, even if it's not good things, like say your septic goes out, say your electric wires need to be redone, whatever it is, you know, that would cost you a good amount of money. Your washing machine breaks down, your dryer breaks down, it had nothing to do with the devil, the thing is 35 years old. You know, you want to cast the devil out of it. Meanwhile, you never even took care of it to clean the lint out of it, you know. <laughs> but say it breaks down. Instead of, oh, man, the devil's taking my stuff. and everything. How about just saying, praise God. You know what? God's going to provide everything I need. Everything I need. 
I'll tell you, I, I testify to you today. I testify that there has been things that happened that showed up. And I'll tell you something, God always showed up. He always showed up. Always showed up. Always showed up. I remember, just give you this testimony. <laughs> I'm going to give you testimony. I didn't have enough money put in my budget for the water system when we built our home because I didn't know exactly what we were running into. I used my budget to the limit, okay? You know, who knew they were going to go down four times the amount of footage than I thought, okay? But you know what? And then I needed, after prayer and confessing, I still needed something to purify the water, okay? And thank God we had better water than anybody in the area from what I've seen, but I still needed something. And then I found out the something that we were trying to get around was like $3,800. Well, I want to testify that God gave a man who has a business all that equipment to us for free. Amen. A Catholic man that don't come to the Mannington Outreach Center. Amen. So we just want to bless you. <laughs> Catholic man. How about a Mennonite who comes down to sit down with my bill and say, well, we're going to take 8000 10000 We're going to take 10000 off your bill right here. His wife looks at him. He says, just take that off. She was doing the work. Take off the 10000 on him. We had pizza together, didn't we? Amen. She says, when's your services? <laughs> it's a Mennonite. Are you listening to me? God's got so many people. Okay, so many people. What am I saying? He picked up the slack that I missed in my budget. God picked up the slack. It never, ever stopped. Anything I did, it looked like I couldn't get the gate I wanted. Well, I got the gate I wanted. Okay? And the money just kept showing up and showing up and showing up. The problem with the body of Christ is we want to try to figure out how God's going to do it. How's he going to get me out of this mess? Or how's he going to give me this thing that I'm believing for? Okay. It's not how, it's who. It's, to, it's called trust and reliance. He's got so many people he can line you up with. So many people at all. But your motives have to be right. Okay? Your motives have to be right. You know, uh, you could be sure that if I was wasting money on, on frivolous stuff out of order in my life, I mean, I don't believe God would have showed up with those people. Because he doesn't bless a mess. You ever hear that one? He doesn't bless a mess. <laughs> These are some good principles we're learning. Are you at Psalms 35? Amen. Now look at verse 27. Let them shout for joy and be glad that the favor, that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, Lord which had, magnified. amen, which had pr uh, pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Let the Lord be magnified which had pleasure in the prosperity of a servant. Oh, you're going to have to get a new will. Oh, God, the devil, the devil, the devil. The devil, the devil. Well, you better, you better do some overtime because all you're doing is getting the devil in on this. Need a new will. Praise God, my God supplies. You know what? I'm a tither. Don't matter if you make $100 a month. If you give him that first 10%, you're a tithe. I got a covenant. I don't know how, but God's going to show up and help me with this. Amen. It's your attitude. It's your attitude. Instead of when things go wrong, I look at things that when things go wrong, like uh, Pastor Jeff was talking about doing the work in the building, I'm serious on that principle. You know, I was just telling uh, another minister not long ago, if, if we're only the, if we're the part of the 17%, of the body of Christ that actually truly tithes. If we're that part, we're just going to have to suffer and handle all the percentage, 83%. <laughs> it's 83%. If we're going to have to suffer and take the 83% of people that are out of covenant with God, we're just going to have to take their blessings. Because God is 100% God. Okay, I'm serious. You know, if that's what the statistics are, only 17% actually tithe, you know. And, and tithing is a, a strong, powerful New Testament covenant with God. Not just Old Testament, but New Testament covenant. That's what sets us up. I know people don't like to hear it, but, you know, God says uh, in Galatians 6, 7, for I will not, God will not be mocked for what a man sows he will reap. 
and that's true even to the sinners who sow money to help uh, different situations, they, they get something back. God alone, nobody, anything. But to go past that, okay, to go past that for a Christian, that's your covenant, and then what you give on top of that brings in harvest for your, for your life. Even in a time of when, they, uh, when they, uh, the farmer would sow, he would keep the best part of the harvest for seed. He wouldn't eat the seed. He'd put it away for his next year harvest. You're excited, aren't you? <clears throat> this truth can change your thinking. Do you want to uh, please God? You want to give God pleasure through your serving? Hallelujah. Then ask him. I've asked him. Release prosperity into your life for the gospel's sake. You know, I have no, no wonders of if I had $10 million sitting around what I would do with it. I got plenty of things to do with it. Okay? I got plenty of things to do with it. Are you listening to me? There's plenty of things to do with that money. Plenty of things to do with it. Because they're all wondering, I wonder what I would do. I don't know what you would do. But if your priorities are right, let me tell you something. Huh. You can't live in the White House without being affected by all the stuff around you. Okay? You know, you live in the White House, you don't have to be concerned about whether you're going to get heat or air conditioning. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. You live in the prosperity of God. Take care of the things of the kingdom. You won't be concerned how you live. You'll be living good. Amen. And you'll be having some nice stuff. Yeah. That comes with it. Amen. It's something that God don't want us to focus on. It's already paid for. Yeah. Okay. See, but you have to make that decision on your own. And, and I'm really am. I'm calling in young people. What do you mean young people? Young people that are not worn out. Hey, I want to succeed. You know? I don't want to survive. I want to succeed. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to survive. I want to succeed, you know. Uh, it won't be long we'll be seeing how much we actually sowed into the kingdom of God. I don't know if I'm going to be happy with what I sowed. Did you say something? Oh, well, I see that. I won't be. <laughs> but you know what? I could always come in at the last moment and pick, pick up the fall, pick up the slack. Because I have it to do. I have it to do. And I want you to know something. I'm not any kind, I'm not, God don't love me any more than he loves you. But I'm telling you something, I'm learning the principles of God. And they're real, and they work, and they're active, okay? If our priorities are right, it's about our priority. It's not about anything else, it's about our priority. Because God loves you and I so much that he wants us to succeed and keep on keeping on, not succeed for five years or ten years. The, the problem we have in the body of Christ is that we're, we're, we're too busy on trying to prove someone else wrong instead of seeing the truth of the Word of God that's available for us today. And anybody out there who's catching on this but is concerned about all that money, you just bring that money. They took the baskets away. You can put it right here. We'll use it for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There's no lack of things to do. No lack of things to do. Amen. You know, you'll never, see, you'll never hear uh, this church or our TV station begging for money. Never. Oh, if you don't send in, if we don't get this, we're gonna, we've got to go off the air. Go off now, then. I'll tell you why. Why, why are you being like that, Pastor Nick? You've changed your, you're changed your dependency from the Lord to man. The reason a lot of preachers are intimidated, pastors are intimidated, because their congregation is their provision. So if they upset their congregation, then it could affect their provision. We're partners. You and I are partners, but... God is my provider. And you know God's your provider also. And as long as we keep that, it doesn't matter. I'm talking about a pastor because I'm a pastor. But if you work in the, in the coal mine, okay, or if you work at the airport, you work in the car dealership, when your boss becomes your provision, you're in trouble. 
Because now you're going to be manipulated every day of your life. That job is going to control you. Okay? No matter where you work. Hairdresser, post office, coal mine, automobile dealer, electrician, whatever you are. As soon as that job becomes your source, it's going to control you. It's going to suck the life out of you. Yeah. God's going to come secondhand and you go, well, you know, I have to keep this up because I have bills. Yeah, just keep it up. Before you know it, you'll be so far from God, you'll be a traditional Christian. Well, I have to put these things in here. We're talking about God prospering us, us to walk in his covenant, his blessing. Amen? And we, we need to understand that he is glad, he is joy uh, on uh, being, uh, us being prospering. He takes, he takes pleasure in it. Okay. Let's look at the true reason for God's prosperity. Go, to, go over to Deuteronomy 8. I know many of us could quote it. Hallelujah. You know, this is what Christianity is missing. Do you, do you realize this? We serve a God that doesn't make you have to kill yourself to get into heaven. Okay. You don't have to bow down to some wooden image. I mean, we serve a God of life and truth, and yet we're missing it. In these other religions, these people are making money to produce their religion. They're getting educated. They're owning businesses. They're taking over things to produce money for, for their belief, for their religion. And the Christianity, man, God asks you to die to your own ways. Of, ah! <laughs> Jesus died for me. Yeah, thank God. You don't have to fly into an, air, an airplane into a building. Okay? You know, you can mess up and you don't get your hands cut off. My Lord, what a God we have full of grace and strength and wisdom and knowledge. But yet we, we, we lost it. Younger people don't want to serve God because they look at church and they say, it's dead, it's religion, it's dry. Anything with the moving of God, they don't go over there. They got demons over there. All of a sudden, they become de demon believers. All over there, they fall on the floor. They get drunk. Get healed and get delivered. Amen. You see how Christianity has changed? In America, I'm talking about. In America. And the same thing with money. Oh, you're, you're a preacher? Let's go into the other room. We have all our used second-hand equipment. Hey, I believe in using everything I could use, but I'm not going to be labeled as some poor man. 